Hello, and thank you for tuning in for this California economic and housing market update for the week of May 6, 2020. My name is Jordan Levine. I'm the Deputy Chief Economist here at the California Association of Realtors, and I'm excited to get into the numbers with you today. So the data has started to roll in, and unfortunately, what we're seeing in the data is pretty ugly. There are pretty unprecedented impacts to unemployment, consumer spending, and of course, that's obviously bleeding leading through to GDP and to us in the housing market in particular. The good news is that we are starting to see some signs though of a bottom. The declines across the major indicators that we see both in terms of the economy in general, but also the housing market more specifically have started to peter out in recent weeks or in fact even show some recent and nascent signs of life. And so we wanna talk about how we're finally getting our arms wrapped around uh, what a bottom might ultimately look like. And that's a big change even from the last update I did with you all a few weeks ago. And so finally starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Later in this talk, I will also run through the short run outlook. And I think that the moral of the story is that although we are seeing some of that light at the end of the tunnel, we've still gotta be prepared for a period of belt tightening for another six to eight weeks, even as the economy starts to gradually reopen. And most of the forecasts currently are still expecting a decline in the second quarter of this year of something on the order of about 30%. And of course, uh, that means that, you know, we're still, um, even though maybe approaching bottom, have, have again, a couple of potentially difficult months still left ahead of us. And so I want to keep those belts tight and talk about what that, that short run outlook looks like. But then I want to leave you with a bit of a long term perspective on housing, because I think that, you know, like the rest of the economy, housing will be negatively impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak of the short run. But I also think it's important to keep in mind that uh, over the long run, the, the value and benefits of home ownership, which we try and stress all the time, remain largely intact as in the aftermath of this crisis. And in fact, I think that um, the, the value proposition of residential real estate in particular is actually potentially even going to improve in the wake of this downturn. And, and so I want to talk about some of those structural forces that still make housing attractive and some of the, the accelerated changes that this might bring on that will, again, make housing look even better for consumers out there in the marketplace. So let's take a look at the economic data first and get some of that bad news out of the way because uh, we know that the economy and the housing market are both feeling the impacts. And, and although economic data is, again, inherently backward looking, we're starting to get a better sense of what March and more importantly, um, what April is looking like that's giving us our ability to, to kind of get a sense of that size and scope of how deep this downturn actually is. Uh, when you look at the consumer confidence numbers, you can see that we've had our biggest decline in consumer confidence in almost 50 years as of April. And so these are numbers that are fresh off the press. And you can see what a significant retrenchment has happened in the mindset of consumers out there in the economy. But it's not just a gut reaction, right? In fact, we see that there was actually a, a major pullback in consumer spending as well. So what I'm showing you in this chart is the decline in retail sales on an annualized basis for March. And you can see that it's the biggest decline in recent history, but it's also the biggest decline ever recorded in retail sales since we began tracking this data many years ago. When we consider this number just from the standpoint of the timeline of events, it's important to keep in mind that really only that last two weeks, one and a half to two weeks of March was really impacted with most shelter in place orders not going into effect until about the 16th of March or even a couple of days afterward. And so to see such big declines in consumer spending when only half the month was impacted does suggest that the consumer pullback is going to be even more grim when the day for April and indeed May is finally released. 
why that matters so much is because consumers actually play an oversized role in the economy. So here on the left hand side, you can see that consumer spending in the 2019 GDP data represented about 70% of the economy as a whole with everything else. And that includes uh, government spending, business investment, inventory accumulations, international trade, residential, non-residential construction, all of that put together represents just 30% roughly of the entire US economy as measured by GDP, which is really just a fancy way of talking about the income that is earned by businesses and individuals in our economy at large. But it's not just the size or the, the slice of the pie that is represented by consumers. They're also the, the slice that's actually growing the fastest. And so if you look on the right hand side, you can see that GDP overall grew by roughly 23% between the end of the recession, roughly a decade ago, and the end of 2019. But if you actually scratch the surface of that number, you could see that almost 19% of that 23% increase was due to an expansion on the part of US consumers. Uh, so, so in other words, consumers have largely been not just the biggest chunk of the overall pie, but the ones carrying the, the load in terms of overall growth since the end of the Great Recession, again, roughly a decade ago. And that is why the impacts that we're seeing play out across the economy currently are so significant because this is really the, the category of the economy that's most impacted by the current COVID-19 crisis. We have both um, the shelter in place order, which is preventing folks from getting out there and spending money in the local economies. We've obviously got a lot of economic uncertainty that has arisen out of the uh, financial volatility and financial markets that we've seen over the course of the last couple of months. And then of course, we've also got the real honest to goodness economic effects where folks have either lost um, hours, lost jobs and therefore lost income, uh, which is really the kind of trifecta when it comes to those big declines in consumer spending that I had detailed for you earlier. Uh, and of course, as goes the consumer, so goes the economy. And so even though, again, these are inherently backward looking numbers and we only have real GDP growth through the first quarter of 2020, what you can see is that the economy actually shrank by almost 5% in the most recent data. Now, again, critical to keep in mind that this is likely just the tip of the iceberg because, again, when you think about a, a quarter spanning over 12 to 14 weeks, we're really only talking about that last two-ish weeks of the, of the 12 to 14 week period that comprises the first quarter that was really impacted by the shelter in place. And so the 5%-ish the decline that we saw in the first quarter is actually much worse than what was projected. Most analysts expected and CAR included in that something on the order of between a three to three and a half percent decline in first quarter GDP, just because again, the first kind of 10 to 12 weeks were relatively unimpacted by coronavirus. And in fact, the, the first couple months of 2020 was actually shaping up to be a, a pretty solid year. And so I think this is, is less an indication of how bad the impacts of COVID-19 are and more a harbinger of what we can expect to come down the pike when the uh, second quarter numbers are eventually released sometime three to four months from today. Of course, California also ended its kind of 10 year long winning streak when it comes to jobs. We had basically a decade of almost uninterrupted growth outside of the Verizon strike back in 2016, but that all came to an abrupt halt in May of 2020 with almost 100,000 jobs being shed from non-farm payrolls. And again, this should be interpreted as just a, a an early indication of what's to come because of the fact that the end of the month was really the only impacted portion. We know that when we look at indicators like unemployment insurance claims, that the number of folks having lost their jobs here in California is well in excess of this 100,000, but even at just 100,000 jobs lost, that represents 
uh, folks who, who aren't out there earning income and therefore aren't able to pump those dollars back into the economy on rent payments, car payments, um, buying groceries, buying food, paying utilities, et cetera. And again, why we saw those significant negative impacts in our overall GDP number for, for the first quarter. And, and the numbers for April and May are likely to be much worse than, than what we see here even in, in the March number, which is already fairly grim. Of course, that's not the only record that we are breaking, and I brought just a smattering to show you how broad-based the impacts are. We had the biggest drop in housing starts in almost 40 years, the largest decline in builder sentiment ever, right? When folks can't go out there and shop for homes, builders aren't feeling too confident about breaking ground on new projects. Several different manufacturing indexes are either at their lowest level ever, like the Empire Manufacturing Index, or in the case of the government's own measure of industrial production at kind of post-World War II levels that we haven't seen in, you know, again, almost 80 years time. The Philly Fed's index of current economic activities also at its lowest level in 40 years. I could go on, but you get the point that, that this is happening across a variety of indicators economically. And, and what it all boils down to is that we estimate something on the order of between three and a half and five million folks have actually asked for permission to go ahead and skip their mortgage payments and go into uh, forbearance. And so you can just see how broad based these impacts across the, the macro economy truly are as a result of COVID-19. And, and this is really where the rubber meets the road on these kind of nerdy, esoteric economic concepts, right? Is that all of these uh, declines in consumer confidence or economic uncertainty and things that are playing themselves out in retail sales and GDP, they really manifest as something that's much more easy to understand in the form of unemployment. And we have seen that over 30 million individuals have filed for unemployment insurance over the course of just a little over the last month now. You can see that this meets the literal definition of what it means to be off the charts and we've had to um, change the scale on all of our old unemployment charts just to fit this kind of unprecedented rise in unemployment that I'm showing you here on the far right hand side. But just to put an even finer point on that, if you look at the, the numbers during the Great Recession and between the beginning of 2008 to the midpoint of 20, 2009, when unemployment insurance claims peaked, that 18 to 20 month period saw about 37 million people file for unemployment insurance. And so in just a little over six weeks, we've already gotten most of the way there in what was otherwise the uh, previous kind of record as the worst downturn since the, the Great Recession. And so it really gives you a sense of just how uh, fast this has, the economic impacts have, have ramped up and just how unprecedented this is in the context of, of the, the kind of broader downturn that, that these consequences are actually driving. What I've done for you here is to try to extrapolate that forward and to give us a sense of what unemployment rates look like here in California. And so if you just take the roughly three-ish million folks in California who over the last six weeks have filed an unemployment insurance claim and you tie it in with the monthly unemployment rate numbers provided by the Employment Development Department, you can come up with numbers that are somewhere in the 18 to 19 percent unemployment range for April. This is an, an estimate by us at CAR, not the official number, um, but it gives you a sense of just how quickly unemployment has ramped up. In fact, there's uh, other analysts out there who peg the current California unemployment rate closer to 20 or 22 percent. So these numbers are, are fairly conservative. But when you look back again at what was the worst recession since the Great Depression back in 2010, California's unemployment rate topped out at about 12.3%. So we've already blown well past the, the heights of the Great Recession again in just a, a single month or a month and a half's time. And so again, 
this is really where the rubber meets the road because this results in that decline in spending, the decline in economic growth, and, and obviously the, the kind of tough times that we're suffering through currently from an economic standpoint. Realtors are also feeling the effects of this in our own specific business, right? These aren't just kind of broad, nebulous economic impacts. These are things that we're seeing happen right on the ground from, from the standpoint of the real estate industry. And so uh, when we talk to realtors, as we have been doing for the last uh, eight-ish weeks, you can see that that they're, they're struggling with their clientele. So over 40% of realtors that we're speaking to, and this is the, the data that came out on May 4th, so hot off the press, but we're still looking at roughly two out of five realtors have actually had a buyer not just get generalized cold feet, but actually remove uh, an offer or withdraw an offer that they had otherwise been ready to pull the trigger on, right? That still means that roughly 60% um, have not withdrawn offers, but still two out of five realtors are, are suggesting that buyers have taken a step back beyond just simply getting uh, those cold feet. Very similar themes on the seller side. In fact, it's actually slightly higher with 50%, a little bit more than 50% of realtors that have had sellers not just get cold feet again, but actually withdraw or pull that home down off of the, the MLS. And so uh, you can see that this is basically one out of every two realtors that we're speaking to, even though this has come down from almost 60% three weeks ago to 51% two days ago at the time of this recording, we're still talking about uh, significant issues with sellers taking a, a step back. What's interesting, and, and you can see this in our recent poll of consumer housing sentiment, these are consumers here in California, and we've been doing this survey for over a year now and just asking very simple questions. Is it a good time to buy? Is it a good time to sell? And you can see similar uh, phenomenon as what I just reported on in our member survey data where sellers seem to have taken a much bigger step back than buyers. In fact, uh, you know, prior to the outbreak in February, 62% of consumers that we were speaking to in California suggested that it was a good time to sell a home in California. And if you fast forward to the last couple of months in our April survey and now in our most recent May survey, which just came out this week as well, you can see that it has been cut virtually in half or actually a little bit more than half whereas good time to buy remains kind of in those doldrums of about 28 to 31 percent that we've seen over the course of the last 18 months pretty consistently. In fact, time to buy actually improved a little bit as rates have come down uh, in the wake of, of this crisis. And so I think when you put it all together, what it means is that from an inventory standpoint, with sellers having taken that bigger step back than buyers, that inventory is actually still pretty tight. There's less buyer demand to be sure, but there's also less supply. And so for those buyers who are still out there, um, there's actually fewer options to choose from. And I think that's why, candidly, we haven't seen a lot of movement in terms of home prices as a result of COVID-19 thus far. Big issues that we're seeing in terms of the actual business of being a realtor out there is twofold. One, a lot of transactions simply aren't making it through the escrow process. And in the data from last week, members reported that 30% uh, have had a, a transaction fall out of escrow due to coronavirus. That's down a tiny bit. Uh, it was 31% two weeks ago. But, but still a significant number of transactions not able to make it all the way through to closing. When you scratch the surface of that number, roughly 84% is due to buyers backing out in some way, shape, or form. Part of that includes this 20%, which is due to loan funding issues, but also um, buyers just getting cold feet, economic uncertainty, want to wait for another deal. And so there's a whole uh, myriad of reasons, but, but largely boils down to um, buyers not being able to or deciding they don't want to continue to move forward. What's interesting and potentially a ray of light is that we do see just broader economic uncertainty playing a smaller and smaller role in the reasons people are giving for transactions 
falling out. That being said, there's still significant challenges both on the financing side and just on the kind of, uh, you know, price decline potential buying at the top of the market considerations that are driving this as well. On the other side of things, we see that for the transactions that do continue to move forward, uh, roughly two thirds are experiencing delays in closing. And there, the data is pretty clear that this is mostly due to financing issues. 66% of realtors who've had a transaction delayed report that it's due to some kind of an issue in terms of loan funding. And in fact, this number is still on the rise. So we have not seen that plateau. It continues to increase as a share of the reasons why transactions are slowing. And we've seen FICO scores get jacked up. Um, you know, Jumbo and non-QM money in some cases has disappeared. Sometimes they want more uh, down payments. Other times the, the products are there, but they've essentially priced themselves out of the market because there's no downstream buyer um, for these loans once they get uh, originated. And so what it all boils down to is that we've seen over the course of the last month and a half, that escrow times have gone, and that's essentially the time from when a, a transaction goes pending to when it's actually recorded as a close, has grown from pretty solidly at, at 30 days with virtually no variation up to about 33 days as a current median. And so as a median, what that means is that actually 50% of the closings are actually taking more than 33 days to get through that escrow process. And so I think that it, it represents a significant challenge for us as practitioners, but also in some ways an opportunity, right? Because our clients need us more than ever. They need our expertise and, and need us to really help to shepherd these transactions all the way through to close because the environment is is so much more challenging for a number of reasons that you know yes we're going to have to work a lot harder but i do think that because our clients need us so much in this particular point in time that if we can successfully um, shepherd these things through to close that we will have earned uh, significant customer loyalty as a result so kind of the the, the silver linings there on, on that one. And I mentioned that we really haven't seen much impact on prices. And in fact, if you look at the, the per square foot median price data across California, you can see that actually prices are fairly stable over the course of the last three to four weeks, not significant movements one direction or another. We don't see prices really ramping up and accelerating as they had been in January and February of this year, but we also don't see um, significant movements to the downside either. And that is a, a critical point, something that really distinguishes this downturn from something that we saw back in 2008, just not a lot of price movements. In fact, if you translate those into percentage changes, you can see that the Bay Area and the Central Coast are looking at essentially um, low to mid single digit declines in terms of that per square foot median price. But in Southern California and the Central Valley, prices are either flat or even up slightly from where they were before those shelter in place orders were actually issued. All of that being said, buyers actually think that there have been price impacts. And so we've seen pretty consistently that something on the order of between 80 and 90% with only 82% in the most recent data, but still a plurality of, of realtors are reporting that buyers actually are expecting lower prices. And so I think that this is part of that psychological scar tissue that is left over from 2008 where consumers who may be under 40 years of age only really have one uh, contemporary experience with recessions. And that's the 2008 type of recession that comes accompanied with 30, 40, 50% declines in home prices. And, and I think that that is largely what's driving the expectation currently of buyers. Unfortunately, it represents a huge gap in the expectations out there because when we ask realtors, how many of your clients are actually lowering prices on listings in order to attract buyers. And what you can see is that A, it's only about 33% at its apex two weeks ago, and B, that number is actually coming down through that first week of May. And so uh, ultimately, sellers are not on the same page with buyers in terms of having to slash prices. And I think this is really 
emblematic of this idea that sellers view this largely as a temporary phenomenon. And I showed you the data on sellers pulling their homes down off of the market. Maybe they decide to list it once the dust clears on this thing in August. Maybe they wait till next year and relist it again in the spring of 2021. But what we're not seeing is sellers feeling really motivated to slash price by double digits to get ahead of what they see as a more prolonged uh, economic and financial crisis. And so, uh, you know, ultimately what it boils down to is I think that um, we're going to have to be the arbiters of this gap in expectations because not only do buyers expect prices to come down, in fact, almost 30% of realtors that we're speaking to suggests that their clients are actually trying to renegotiate the price after they're already in escrow. And that number has been pretty stable around, uh, you know, two or three out of five transactions or members that we're actually speaking to on this front. And so again, I think that uh, we're going to have to be the ultimate arbiters of, of this gap in expectations out there. And of course, when you look at the actual MLS data, you see very similar themes playing out. So here I'm showing you the, the number of active listings on all of the MLSs in California, which we're pulling every single day, and just superimposed a very simple question on top. How many of those listings are still at the original list price, which is what's represented by these light blue bars, and how many of those listings have actually had to reduce price or have reduced price? And those are the dark blue bars. And what you can see is if you scan across the month of March and into the beginning of May, those dark blue bars aren't getting much taller, right? We don't see this surge in the percentage of active listings that are actually reducing price. And so again, just this idea that sellers are viewing this as temporary and, and buyers that are expecting several hundred thousand dollar price reductions, um, you know, might be in for, for a potentially rude awakening on that front. And of course, we're seeing this play out across the market data. So not only are we surveying realtors every single week, we're also going into the MLSs, as I said, every single day so that we have a better sense and a more timely sense of what's happening in the market without waiting for those inherently backward looking economic indicators to eventually be uh, released. And what you can see is that sales were down about 28% statewide from where they were in the kind of pre-crisis economy. You can see that sales actually held up fairly strong through the first three weeks of March and even into that first week of the shelter in place. But that was because we still had this pipeline of pending sales that continued to work themselves through to close during that initial phase of the shelter in place. But as we got into the tail end of March and indeed through the first couple of weeks of April, we saw the, that the trends that we were seeing almost overnight in terms of pending and new listing eventually started to play themselves out in terms of closed sales such that again, we're down almost 30% statewide from where we were uh, prior to the, the shelter in place. That's why I think that even though we released our, our numbers for March for the statewide press release and those numbers do show a 6.1% decline in terms of closed sales, we really should be viewing this as the tip of the iceberg. As I showed you, the closed sales took a while to register the declines in listings and pendings that we saw happen almost overnight as the shelter in place orders were issued. And so when, when it comes time for the April numbers, and I already showed you this playing itself out in the weekly data, that the numbers for April and indeed May are likely to be uh, much more grim than what this kind of March number would suggest. And so I, I look at this again as a harbinger of what's to come for April and May rather than an assessment of exactly how uh, significant the, the COVID-19 impacts are at this point. That's the bad news, right? The good news is that we are starting to finally get a sense of and get our arms wrapped around just how deep this decline is ultimately going to end up being and indeed getting some preliminary signs of just, uh, just where the bottom actually might be on this thing. First and foremost is in terms of the closed sales, right? So, uh, you know, if you actually look at the most recent weekly data, yes, sales in the Bay Area were still down a little bit, but the pace of decline has eased dramatically. And in fact, uh, in, in Southern California, 
the Central Coast and indeed in the state as a whole, uh, closed sales actually ticked up a tiny bit. It's not at a pace that we can declare ourselves at the bottom or to start to celebrate the recovery that is impending, but it does suggest that we're starting to get towards the bottom and that these precipitous declines that we've experienced over the last month are starting to peter out and lose some momentum. The other positive sign is that new listings have actually not just uh, leveled off, but actually have started to increase in recent weeks. So at the statewide level, we're still down about 30-ish percent from where we were in terms of the pre-crisis economy. But for the last three to four weeks consecutively, we have seen the number of new products being entered onto the MLS actually increasing, right? So we don't wanna celebrate because we're still at depressed levels, but things are starting to move in the right direction and those declines that we saw happen almost overnight have really decelerated and in fact shown some signs of life again in recent weeks. Even more encouraging is on the pending sales numbers and you can see that um, yes, pending sales were even more impacted than either closed sales or new listings falling between 40 to 50% or even more in some cases, depending on which specific market. But you can also see this clear sign that across the state, right? San Francisco Bay Area, Southern California, Central Valley, uh, they hit bottom and have either found some nascent signs of stability or indeed have actually started to creep up. We don't wanna pop the champagne corks. We're still at depressed levels relative to where we were before this crisis but we do see that pending sales have started to move in the right direction from a kind of statewide standpoint. You see this across a variety of other indicators as well, right? Where we're starting to get a sense of what the bottom looks like. If you look at private showings, they basically cratered that first week of the shelter in place, dropping by something on the order of 650 to 75%, but what you can see here is that those numbers actually stabilized during that first week or two of April, and since then, the declines have been decelerating. As, as of May 3rd, we are still below where we were at this time last year, or still in decline relative to last year, but only by about nine to 10%, not the 60 and 70% declines that we had seen uh, come online virtually overnight as shelter-in-place orders were issued. We see it in the mortgage applications numbers, right? So um, on a year-to-year -year basis, which I'm showing you here on the right-hand side, you can see that that first week or two of the shelter in place, new purchase applications, new mortgage applications for purchase were down by about 30%. But you can also see that the pace of that decline has started to slow in the annual growth rates, right? And in fact, when you look on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the week-to-week -week percent changes. And the reason why those year-to-year -year numbers are, are getting back towards zero is because mortgage applications have actually increased nationwide over the course of the last two weeks on the order of about 13 percent for the U.S. as a whole. So again, huge declines that happened almost overnight, but the last two weeks we seem to have found a bottom not just in our survey data, but across all that MLS data as well as in this external data that I'm showing you here. And you can see that for California, we are actually uh, even more aggressive, and that's true of California in general, right? When the economy is going good, California is leading that charge, and when times are bad, we feel it more acutely. And what you can see is that that's true here as well. So if you look at the year-over-year -year growth rates, the declines in California are bigger, but you also see on the left-hand side in the weekly data that the recent increases are bigger here than they have been elsewhere. In fact, California is on its third weekly increase compared to just two weeks of growth in the nation as a whole. And so lots of evidence that we're starting to get our arms wrapped around uh, how deep this thing actually is, which is a big change from where we were even as recently as, as two weeks ago. Uh, we even see it in the labor market numbers, right? And, and we're still adding millions of people to the unemployment rolls every week. I don't wanna sugarcoat this and, and suggest that we're out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, but it is encouraging that we've gone from a point in time with virtually no new unemployment claims to 3.3 million to almost 7 million. But since then, over the course of the last four weeks, 
there's consecutively been fewer folks um, added to the unemployment roll. Still millions of people, and it still equates to over 30 million unemployed individuals in this country, so I don't want to downplay it. But again, just in terms of getting our arms wrapped around how deep this actually is, it seems like we're past the apex of the impacts and that the, the declines are starting to peter out and in some cases actually show some, some movement in the right direction. Of course, this largely comes down to the virus itself. And you can see that at the end of May, end of March, excuse me, we were still projected to, once you added on these uh, margins of error, to potentially exceed our capacity to provide ICU beds and ventilators. And more importantly, at least from an economic standpoint, that we weren't looking to get towards something that was more manageable until early to mid June, right? And if you fast forward to the numbers that came out yesterday, as I record this, you can see that the curve really has been flattened. We are no longer, even once you bake in the margins of error, projected to exceed our capacity um, to deal with this crisis. But more importantly, if you look at the timing now, um, we're at something that's more manageable in early to mid-May instead of early to mid-June. And, and we know that, that that is consistent with what we see uh, in terms of the government starting to gradually reopen the economy, or at least saying they're going to over the course of the next couple of weeks. And that is a testament to um, you know, having flattened the curve. And that is absolutely critical that we went hard early um, because timing really is everything. And so uh, that's the, the good news. Short run, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. Things have shown that they're finding a sign of bottom and potentially even moving in the right direction, but it still means that we're in for a period of belt tightening in the real estate market for at least the next six to eight weeks, um, even as the economy starts to gradually open back up and as the listings and pending start to move in the right direction. Point number one is that it takes a while for pending sales to show up as closed transactions. This is the same reason why, even though we were in the midst of a shelter in place, the first three to even four weeks of March held up relatively well from a closed sales standpoint because we were still burning through um, the last two months prior pending sales, right? And so even though we see signs that pending are moving in the right direction, it's going to take a while for those to ultimately show up in closed sales, point number one. And point number two, even with this recent growth, we're still well below the kind of pre-crisis numbers that we can expect. And so moving in the right direction, but it's going to take a while for this to actually materialize into closed sales and therefore uh, income uh, for us as practitioners. The other thing is we're still looking at a second quarter GDP growth number that's something on the order of about 30%. That's where all of the forecasts are converging. And so even though we're getting a sense of that bottom, that bottom is 30% below where we were even in the first quarter of this year. And that's going to cause this pain in labor markets and the reduction in spending that we're still going to be dealing with over the course of at least the next six to eight weeks. Uh, before things start to to inevitably um, turn that that corner, so um, you know we're seeing those signs of hope, but it's going to take a while for that to to actually play out for us in the economy and in the housing market. And of course, uh, you know for for businesses, there's only a handful, roughly 25 percent, that can actually afford to make it through much more uh, than two weeks, so or than two months, excuse me, in terms of their cash on hand and so if we have a a second wave or a double dip or however you want to characterize that we're going to have to to rejigger our our outlook for the third and fourth quarters um you know things are are currently poised for a decent bounce back in the third quarter not all the way back to pre-crisis levels but at least to, to regain some of that lost ground but if we have to uh, re-shelter in place again at some point down the road that's a much different proposition from the standpoint of of the the eventual recovery and of course, we're, we're still in an environment, and I showed you this data before, where we're essentially at Great Depression levels of unemployment in California. And again, this is just our estimate, and we do think that it's possible that the number is even higher in the 20% range. And so even though we're starting to see the increases in unemployment start to peter out, we're adding fewer and fewer folks to the rolls each week, 
we've still got a pretty uh, significant kind of buildup of unemployment and that itself is gonna take a while to burn through even if the economy starts to open back up and some of these jobs start to get added back. This is a process that's gonna take months to chip away at um, even in a best case kind of scenario with no second wave. And so um, again, things are looking up. But, but we don't want to over celebrate it or, or declare victory or declare that the recovery uh, has started. We're just um, able to get a sense of, of how deep this thing actually is. And again, um, we'll, we'll be able to start to chip away at that once the economy starts to open back up. And so when you, when you ask me for the specific forecast, I think that yes, the economy is on track to shrink by between 30 and 40% during the second quarter, and that unemployment here in California will go above 20%. And what that means for us is that we expect double digit declines in home sales for April and May and indeed into June. And even though we don't see big impacts on the price front, I do think that you know we could potentially see um, single digit declines at most, but nothing on the order of the 2008 financial crisis that we saw uh, last time around, or indeed that buyers may be expecting from that psychological scar tissue that they still have kicking around up there. And so I think that for me, the biggest question remains the, the virus itself. And so um, if, if there is a second wave or we end up having to re-shelter in place, then obviously the numbers are gonna be more dire than what I've presented for you here. But of course, we'll continue to stay on top of those numbers. I think that in addition to those broader macro impacts, we're also gonna have to navigate the expectations gap for between buyers and sellers. And I think that the, the advice I would give you there is twofold. One, we've got to distinguish, especially for the buyers, that this is not 2008 all over again. Yes, this is an unprecedented shock that's having unprecedented economic impacts for our economy, but it's a shock that's happening to what was otherwise a relatively healthy economy. In fact, the first two months of 2020 were actually accelerating across the broad macro indicators and in terms of home sales and prices. And so um, this is a, a much different economy than we had in 2008, where household balance sheets were not in good shape. We had financial and debt obligation ratios that were unsustainable. We had lots of uh, mortgage market issues, and we all remember the ninja lending, right? The no income, no job or asset lending that really was kind of that ticking time bomb uh, bubbling under the surface of the 2008 economy that simply isn't present this time around. In fact, uh, most folks this time around are in 30-year fixed rate mortgages. They've got some skin in the game. They've had to document their income. And if anything, I would argue that mortgage credit has been too tight this time around and not enough folks have been able to get their foot on the property ladder. And so again, we don't have that kind of ticking time bomb element under the surface that really caused all the snowball effects to begin to cascade when uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went out of business back in 2008. The other thing I think we have to do is just to keep it really real and cut through the rhetoric and you know, be the experts for our clients. Yes, the market is tough, but inventory is still relatively tight. And I showed you that in the member survey where sellers have taken a bigger step back than buyers. I also showed you that same information in the eyes of consumers where good time to sell dropped way more than time to buy. And, and when you have less inventory out there and the market is still tight, um, it, it kind of precludes these deeper impacts to prices that many buyers are actually uh, expecting. And so remind them about the low rates, right? That rates are at historic lows and don't just sell the home, but actually sell the benefits of home ownership and get those buyers focused not on the next 12 to 18 months, but on the next 10 to 20 years and all of the benefits and the whole reason why you get into home ownership in the first place. And that's how I think that we navigate not just these, these challenging macro times, but also this gap where buyers and sellers don't appear to be on the same page. When you look at housing from a long-term standpoint, I remain optimistic. Keep in mind that uh, I am doing this outreach with you today as the son of somebody who used to walk around in the early 80s bragging about his 12 and a half percent uh, mortgage interest rate. And so once the dust settles and people realize that we are in a historically low rate 
environment. I think that that will be a boon, not just to the macro economy, but to housing in particular, and to housing in California in particular, where even little movements in rates have big impacts on monthly mortgage payments and where affordability is one of our paramount challenges in boosting home ownership. I also think that rates could potentially go even lower. And I won't get into all the nerdy technical details, but if you look at where 10-year treasuries are at, they're usually a good predictor of 30-year fixed rate mortgages. And right now, we're running about 100 basis points higher um, than we traditionally do relative to that 10-year treasury. And so there's all kinds of mortgage market frictions that are currently trying to be worked out at the, uh, at the policy level in Washington, D.C., and I don't think that we'll realize the full 100 basis point reduction in mortgage rates, but I also don't think it's unthinkable that we see maybe 2.8, 2.9% mortgage rates when the dust settles, which again will be a huge advantage to California's housing market uh, moving forward. In addition to that, all of the long-term benefits of housing are, are still relatively unaffected by this, right? The health benefits, the wealth benefits, the educational benefits, the intergenerational benefits that let uh, the son of a high school dropout be here speaking with you today about the impacts of the economy are all still there when it comes to the value proposition for housing. In addition, I think that this structural shift that this outbreak and this crisis is causing is in many ways just gonna accelerate trends that we had already seen starting to form with not as many people being chained to um, dense urban cores for jobs. We're gonna have more uh, remote working. We're gonna have fewer folks having to commute into these dense job centers in the Bay Area and in Southern California. And, and you know, in many ways, folks were stuck in markets that they couldn't afford to become homeowners because that's where their jobs were. And I think this gives folks the opportunity um, to, to pursue home ownership, which we know that folks still aspire to from our survey data, but simply couldn't afford right next to where their job was actually located. And so again, I think that this gives folks um, the opportunity to actually achieve home ownership by not having to go into these dense urban cores, because I think that there's going to be many companies that realize that productivity can, in fact, be maintained and that levels of service can remain high, even in a remote work environment. In addition to that, I think that like me, many folks have spent the last six weeks in their room and are really um, taking a hard look at their housing investment. And so um, not only are those long-term historical benefits of home ownership still intact, I think that in many ways this crisis has made the value proposition for housing um, even stronger. And because we're all spending so much time in our home, housing is gonna be more important to us uh, moving forward than than ever and so um, you know in in conclusion I would just say that you know the bad news is that the data is rolling in and the data is ugly right we're seeing it both in terms of the uh, consumer spending numbers how it's playing out across GDP and indeed uh, in those labor market numbers with unprecedented numbers of folks having to apply for unemployment uh, insurance. The good news is that we are starting to see those signs of a bottom. Um, we, we have our arms wrapped around how, how deep this downturn is ultimately going to be uh, when, when the dust ends up settling. Um, and in fact, some of the economic indicators and indeed some of the housing market indicators are showing some signs of light. That being said, we still need to keep it real and expect that we're in for at least another six to eight weeks of belt tightening. Even as the economy starts to open back up, we first need to be able to build up that pipeline of listings, of pending sales, before we're gonna see any of this actually show up in terms of closed transactions. And of course, we're gonna keep our eye on the virus itself. And if there's a second wave, then we will obviously have to rejigger uh, these numbers. But ultimately, I think that we are getting some indications that this too shall pass. And even though we can't pop the, uh, the champagne corks quite yet, we are starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. That is a wrap for this update for the week of May 6, 2020. I appreciate your time and we will keep you updated on this stuff in the coming weeks.